Thank you everyone for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, if you don't know me by now, uh, I'm a very emotional person. So there will more than likely be tears because I already feel them forming because I'm really excited to see everyone in this room and it just does my heart great. So I'm really excited. So thank you so much for being here. I am a person who likes pictures and I have lots of pictures. And um, if you want to see them later, I mean, we can probably post them somewhere. But um, some people may be surprised. They may be in some of these pictures. So I'll get started. So my name is Tequila Garrett. And yes, my mother did name me after Tequila the drink <laughs> because it was her favorite drink. And um, she had my older brother were a year and a half apart. And so um, she was like, if I ever have a girl, I'm gonna name her Tequila. And my great grandmother said, no, you're not. And they answered this big argument. So she said she'll spell it different. So hence the spelling of my name <laughs> that everyone would like to say Tequila. So if the I is silent, it's just Tequila. So I'm really excited to talk with you all today. Um, I will share some information and um, it will be very personal. So I um, just want to get that out right now. But um, first thing first, when I think of where I get my strength, um, this is my favorite Bible verse and what I whisper to myself all day throughout the day. And it's, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's Philippians 4.13. And that's something that really helped me throughout my life and everything that I've done. Emotional already. Um, so where it all began. So I was really excited because I got to go through all like my photo albums. I couldn't put all my pictures, but I tried to put as many as I could on these slides. So for me, I was one month old in this picture in blue. And that's my older brother. He seemed to always be crying in the pictures. I think he wasn't happy that he had a younger sister. So um, my brother Wesley and I are very close. And you'll see in a lot of these pictures, you'll see this person right here. This is my cousin, Micaiah. We call her Muffin. And we're five months apart. And so we spent a lot of time together. My family was very close when we were younger. Now that we're older, we're kind of spread apart a lot. On this picture in the corner, Muffin and I are playing with my Nestle tea set. That was my favorite tea set when I was a kid. I have one plate left from that tea set, and I have hidden it. So I still have that one plate, and it was my favorite, and um, I still have it to this day. Bottom corner, Wesley and myself, I'm kind of like blurred out. This picture right here has a lot of significance to me because this was shortly before my third birthday, the third birthday that they didn't think I would make it to. When I was two, I took an overdose of um, pregnant women iron pills. I didn't know what they were. I thought they were M&Ms. And um, I told my mom, I was like, oh, I have M&Ms. She was like, OK, they were playing cards or whatever. Didn't think anything of it. A few minutes later, she asked her cousin, she said, you know, did you have M&Ms in the house? I was like, no. They went to check on me. I was on the floor, passed out. Some pills were hanging out of my mouth. They rushed me to the hospital, um, and the doctors gave me a 50-50 chance of living. And um, they told my mom, if, you know, right now it's between her and God. And they said if I did live, that in those days I would be retarded, um, and I would have abnormal growth, and that I would not um, live a quality life. And so, by the grace of God, I was there. And so, for me, uh, and my mom, you know, you have memories that you go in and out of or when you were younger, and I remember that party. And my mom said, I threw you the biggest birthday party that I could ever throw because my baby was still here. So, that's one of my favorite pictures. So, the early years. Man, those plaid pants are my favorite pants. <laughs> Do not hate on the plaid. That was my outfit. I wore it all the time. My brother and I had matching outfits, so we were like, whew, this is it. 
So I grew up pretty much in Taylor, Michigan. For anyone who knows about Taylor, it's south of Detroit by Metro Airport. Um, pretty homogenous area. So we were probably one of the couple of black families that were there. Actually, we were the only one in our area. Um, but every once in a while, we saw some more black people. Um, but that's where we grew up, 15099 Aubrey Lane. And so that was our spot. This picture in the upper left, those are all my cousins at the time and some foster cousins that my grandmother had. And we all lived in that house together for a year, all together. At that time, my mom had left my dad because he hit her. And um, I still remember that because I could hear the punch. And I remember my brother and I each jumped on a leg of my dad saying, leave my mom alone. And he threw us off. And that's when my mom like really sprung into action. And she said, it's one thing you hit me, but when you hit my kids, it's over. And so at that point in time, she left him. But sometimes, as batter women do, she went back. And so he stopped hitting her at the time, but the mental abuse lasted probably until the day he died. So um, it was a very interesting relationship. And yeah. This bottom picture right here, you can't see it, but there's another cake right here, and it has a five on it. This picture was taken in June. My birthday is in November. My brother's birthday is in May, and we had a double birthday party. <laughs> this is why I have issues. <laughs> so. Celebrated my birthday really early because, hey, one party, two kids. So just something right there. I'd say my mom had like one of the tightest afros I ever knew. So I loved her afro. And then there's a picture of my mom and dad. They really had pictures together. So just more of me because, you know, I love me. So that's me graduating from Head Start. My mom took a job there so she could be with us. She had two children at the time, and she couldn't, she didn't want to part from us. So she volunteered at our Head Start, and then she took a job there as the bus driver. And so we spent a lot of time with my mom growing up. And this is our preschool class. Again, the only black kids. So that was my brother and I. Spent a lot of time around white people. So pretty good at adjusting, adapting. But it was always weird because when we would go around our cousins, they say, why do you talk like that? Like, what are you talking about? You talk white. I didn't know what that was. Everybody sounded the same to me. So, you know, that was really difficult trying to navigate between family. Every time we got together, we'd have the same question. And um, it was really difficult as a kid trying to navigate those two worlds. I specifically put this picture here because look at this furniture. <laughs> My mom had plastic on every piece of furniture in our house. Every piece of furniture. And this black and white set was, you can't see the full picture, but it was a couch and a love seat joined together by a radio in the middle with an eight track player. <laughs> that was our furniture. And we kept that furniture for a long time. That furniture stayed through everything. It was some sturdy furniture. But that was our furniture. And then again, there's my cousin Muff in there with us. And that's my dad. He's cut off. I, I don't know. But he rarely took pictures with us. So that was one of the rare times that we had him um, in the photo, even though he lived with us full time. So that was a very interesting situation. And then this bottom picture is my brother and I with my little sister and my grandma at our first baptism. I was really excited because I had the first um, hand of uh, fellowship. And so, you know, I had my own Bible and we got to shake everybody's hand and it was, it was really great. Oh, right hand of fellowship, yeah. So um, it was really exciting and I felt really good because we were the youngest ones to 
go through that at our church, at First Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor J.L. Davis. Um, so it was really exciting. So junior high happened. I didn't put any pictures of me in junior high because first of all, I had a jerry curl. And then um, <laughs> second of all, it was a really, really tough time for me. In junior high, I was very depressed but no one would know it because I didn't show it. I, um, at that time, I really did contemplate suicide. I had a plan, no one knew. But then I read this book, I was an avid reader. In this book, The Ghost and the Whistling World Gig, in this book, it said that if you commit suicide, you will not go to heaven. And for me, I didn't want to go to hell. So I had to figure out how do I get myself out of this. And at that time, I couldn't talk to my parents about how I was feeling because they weren't very open to listening. And that was tough. Um, they were very strict while we were growing up. I always had to take on kind of like the second mother role with my siblings. Um, as the second oldest and as the first girl, that was my responsibility to take care of everybody. And um, that was very serious for me. And so I gave up a lot of my childhood to do the things that a parent should do. And so sorry. I am um, I found help in reading. Um, some really close friends that I had but not knowing what depression was, was really tough for me. And not understanding what that meant and not being able to explore that was really, really tough. And so not even recognizing until I got older exactly what was happening during that time. And um, it was just, it was difficult. And um, I look at it now because my younger sister also went through um, a period like that. But with her, she was a cutter. And my family didn't understand what that meant to cut and how that felt for her and how that was a release for her. And so having gone through something similar, I was able to talk with her a little bit, but she really hit it a lot and we didn't know. Um, and I discovered by accident what was happening with her. And so um, it was a very, very tough time. And I thank God that I found that book and read it. And because we were so religious at the time, for me, like that was everything um, in wanting to go to heaven. So then, and I also got in a lot of fights. So just so you know. Um, <laughs> So from fourth grade until ninth grade, I had a fight every year, got suspended from school. Um, I had a nemesis every year. For two years, it was Debbie Kid. Then it was BB. Then it was Pam. So um, I had some ladies on. Yeah, I remember them. Uh, and so I had a pretty bad temper at the time. And I always prayed for God to take that temper away from me. Because you say something, it just set off a spark. And don't say the wrong thing. And I can still go with the best of them, but you know, I don't fight anymore. But <laughs> I can argue you down, so <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, and so I had a lot of mouth. I, uh, yeah, I talked a lot. But then high school came and I was like, huh, need to figure something out. So I ended up in a lot of accelerated courses, some AP courses, 
um, and hung out with some different people. My worldview changed. No one ever talked to me about going to college. I had no idea. Didn't even think it was an option because no one in my family went. And so my junior year in high school is when I got really serious and was like, okay, I'm gonna apply to some schools. Everyone around me is talking about going to college. So, you know, maybe I'll do it. I'll see what happens. I worked in school improvement as my student co-op position. I thought I was gonna be a legal secretary because I really liked doing that work. I took shorthand classes. I took two years of typing because I really liked it. I did erase homework and typing. Yeah, I was that person. Um, I talked to someone in school improvement who worked with the gifted and talented program, and he really helped me get a lot of things um, completed as far as college applications and things like that. So Gene was really instrumental in helping me deal with that. For the first time in my life, I met somebody named Dick. I thought it was just, you know, a joke. But you know, <laughs> his name was Dick, and I felt embarrassed to say his name. So, um, I, yeah, that was interesting. I was like, so how do you get Dick from Richard? I didn't understand that, so I don't know. I still don't get that, so if anyone knows, please let me know. Um, so, Working there, and then my senior year, I applied to schools. I thought I was gonna go to Eastern Michigan, and I just applied to some place called Grand Valley because someone else in my school applied. Never heard of Grand Valley, didn't know what was up with that. So, got into Eastern, got into Grand Valley, still have my acceptance letter. I went to Eastern's orientation, got my ID, knew what building I was gonna live in and everything. And then my family was like, that's so great. Now we can come visit you all the time. <laughs> um, I was like, well, I'm going to Grand Valley. <laughs> and they said, why are you going so far away? It's over three hours. I was like, well, they have a good program there. What are you going to major in? Uh, <laughs> psychology, business, uh, something like that. So I came to Grand Valley. Um, my entire family came up with me for orientation, which was right before move-in. And um, my dad took one bag upstairs to the third floor in Robinson. And then he said, there's no elevators in this building. Good luck with the rest of your stuff. <laughs> I was like, OK. Got up there. There were no helping hands. So I wish they had that back in the day, but they didn't. So I graduated, my friends, um, left them all behind. If you know, this, is, this was my favorite outfit, so I have this in a couple pictures, so you'll see that. So I came to Grand Valley, first generation college student. Got involved in my floor government. I was really excited, gung-ho, happy all the time. You know, the Bodyguard soundtrack just came out, so I used to sing that all the time. You know, belted down the hall. I was Whitney. So, you know, it was off the hook. I didn't sound like Whitney, but I thought I did. So, found some people, made some great connections. Sally was my first college roommate. Sally had some issues, and uh, I had a new roommate second semester. <laughs> but you know. Sally was cool for the beginning. Um, still keep in touch with my people in the corner up here. And I joined this organization called the Residence Housing Association, RHJ. Helped to change my life. So my advisor was this guy named Andy. <laughs> and uh, that's him right in that corner right there. <laughs> Next to the only black girl in the student organization. So that was the other issue. No black people wanted to join REJ. So I was all alone every single time trying to figure this stuff out. Um, but I learned some really good skills. I learned you do not drop your advisor on ice um, when you're doing a team building exercise because they don't like that. But it helped me to understand what I wanted to do. I explored a little bit more about this thing called student affairs. So in the meantime, we're hanging out in Kirkup. There's our outfit. See, I told you that was my favorite. 
So hanging out, had a lot of things that happened in Kirkhoff, hung out, took our pictures, and I met my choir director, Cassania. Voices of GBSU, life-changing, fantastic, my community, my people. Um, it was amazing, it was great. Um, helped me to get more connected to Grand Valley along with RHA. So I could be involved in a number of different things and um, still have a good time. I had three people from my high school that came to Grand Valley. One person that I was really close with because we had a number of classes together, she stayed in her room the entire time, the entire first week of school. I was like, I can't do this. I am not watching Young and the Restless all day. <laughs> so I got out, walked around campus, and talked to my RA, and that's how I got involved in floor government. Because she said, you know, go, we have these positions. So notice it was floor government. So she created a floor government so we could do her work. So I was excited. I was like, I'm about to be president. So I went, knocked down every door, talked to every person on my floor, and got elected floor president because I met everyone. And that just started everything that happened in my community. And then they were like, well, you're president. You have to go to our house council meetings. Another meeting? So then I ended up at house council. At the time, you had to pay for your laundry, so we collected quarters each time people went down, and once a week, someone got chosen to get the couple quarters. So that was really exciting, pretty good thing. And then they said, oh, well, because you're on house council, you now have to go to RHA. Why? Because we have to have a representative from our building, so you were the last one, so you have to go. <laughs> okay, so I became the RHA rep. And during that time, I was like, oh, I really like this organization. So I became the fundraising chair of RHA. And that's how I got to spend a lot of time with Dr. Beach now. <laughs> I was in his office during um, exam cram time, writing out checks, like stamping checks, putting them in envelopes, talking about my life, um, crying about my life, laughing about my life. Um, and so, it was a great way to get to know people and get to know an advisor. So one of the things that I always talk about, be the change you wish to see in the world. Nothing happens if you just sit and do nothing. And so for me, it was how do I get more involved on campus? How do I become a leader in the place that I enjoy? So this was a bomb picture back then, so. I was the Kistler fourth even RA. Um, back then you could paint the walls in your hall. So each year we had like a contest of, you know, which design we wanted to paint on the walls. And so we decorated our building. I was in this program called Excel um, and they helped me find a mentor. And it was really great. Her name was Valerie. First black person I know to live in Alaska. I didn't even think black people lived in Alaska. <laughs> so she told me a lot of stories about when she lived in Alaska and all the stuff she did. Very soft-spoken person, very intelligent person, and she really helped me connect with Grand Valley and look at my classes and really what I wanted to major in and sent me to the Career Center. So um, took some career tests, trying to figure that out. They said I should be a teacher. I did a shadowing experience as a teacher. I was like, oh, I love kids. I was in a kindergarten, first grade classroom. I didn't last past lunch. <laughs> I was done. I'm like, y'all can take all them kids home. I left. I decided I could not be a teacher. <laughs> so then, still trying to figure out what I wanted to do. There was a program called Excellence in Leadership. And you went to a series of sessions, you learned different leadership skills, you got to um, make it to like a bronze, silver, gold, diamond level. And it was amazing because it was like that adrenaline rush, like, ooh, hey, I'm bronze right now, but I'm about to be silver. So it was like you check out the boxes and you make it to the next level. And so that program really taught me a lot about public speaking, about getting involved, 
all the different things. So it was kind of like Toastmasters, but I thought it was better. So I liked it because it was more student focused. And so that's how I met Bob Stoll. And um, I had a really good time. The only thing I didn't like is that we had to go to this retreat and it was in the woods in a cabin and I hate camping, but at least it wasn't a tent. So I went there and actually it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun but you did smell like a bonfire when you went home. So that's me. And I know you can't see it, but that's Bart. <laughs> so there are a lot of old faces that you'll see in there. And this is Jay Cooper. <laughs> so Jay was the hippie. He had the long hair and everything. So um, just some faces. If you want to see it, we can look at it later up close. And um, this is Lulan Bond, who used to be a um, hall director here, who unfortunately passed away in a car accident with his new wife. So um, one of my only pictures that I have with him in it. So, RHA, I went to conferences. As a first year, second year, third year student, I was able to attend conferences things I never would have done had I not been a part of that organization. Um, this organization taught me so much about leadership skills and about what I can do as a person, and it taught me how to have fun. Every year I got most spirited delegate, so I was really excited. <laughs> yeah. I had all the cheers, and I'm telling you, this year right here, when we went, that's when the Tootsie Roll came out. <laughs> I made a Tootsie Roll cheer. That's right. And we were on point. Then I was an RA. So that was so exciting. I always wanted to be an RA. Like after I found out what my RA did, I was like, I want that job. And so I strived to get to that position. And I'll tell you, when I applied, I didn't initially get the job. I was devastated. And I mean, Dev said, I was crying. It was like the ugly cry. And it was horrible. And then, like a day or so later, I got called and was like, hey, you're not in Kistler. And then I cried again, because I was like, I don't want to go to Kistler. <laughs> <laughs> that is not where I want to be. But then I got to Kistler, and I was like, I love this place. It was amazing. The community, the staff, this is my, First floor, the fourth floor even, my residence, these two pictures right here, the diagonal picture. And these women were so spirited. I have 58 residents, two sets of twins, identical twins. Yes. And when you talk about there's a good twin and a bad twin, that happened once out of them. The bad twin is not on this picture. So, um, but it was interesting. They kept me on my toes and I loved it and I strived to be the best RA that I could be. Unfortunately, that didn't pan out well for my classes because I was trying to be the best RA that I could be. And so I forgot about this thing called school that I was here for. So um, yeah, we worked on that a little bit afterwards. Um, but my staff and my residents were like my world. I enjoyed it so much and it just gave me so much joy. And I'm still in contact with quite a few people on my staff team. Um, and I had on this picture, this is a PBW Positive Black Women hat. That year, I had received a scholarship that semester before so that I could study abroad from the Positive Black Women group. So when I found that hat in the store, I was like, yep, I'm getting that. That's my hat. And so, um, that was like the beginning of a lot of stuff. And so this is Erin. Erin now works at the University of Michigan with my friend Dewan. They work in the same department. So it's weird the way life kind of works out. But um, there's my study abroad experience. And I never would have studied abroad if it wasn't for my friend James who basically forced me almost to sign up for study abroad. And I just, it wasn't in my 
It wasn't in my view. And it was the best experience I ever had because I went out of the country, I did something new, and my mom, she was so paranoid. If I stayed home, I wouldn't have done anything. She didn't want us to travel. She barely wanted us to go on the highway. So let alone to a different country. And when I did this, did this experience, I didn't initially tell her until it was time to get on the plane. <laughs> because if I had, she probably would have tried to talk me out of it. And I'm so glad that I went and I had the experiences that I had. And I met some wonderful people that I still stay in touch with. Um, that's James right there. And um, he studied abroad three times. Last time he brought back a child. So, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I went one time. So. And this picture right here, this is my friend, Ramey. Ramey and I still talk to this day. She actually is um, like a marriage counselor. And she sometimes is on WZZM, Channel 13 News. So she gives some little talks and we talk, but the first time I met her, we connected so well. We sat and talked for three hours after class. And we just told our entire life stories. We laughed, we cried, we hugged, and um, we made a real connection that day. And so I'm very thankful for study abroad because that really is what brought us together because I would have never taken my sociology class that I had had it not been for, for um, study abroad. So very thankful. Then again, my more leadership, that's at the Excellence uh, Leadership Retreat. And um, yeah, this person right here kind of looks a little bit familiar. I don't know if I can see that, but hmm. That was my hall director my last year at Kistler, her first year. Really appreciate Marlene. Um, she put up with a lot, but was always sweet and very gracious. And um, during my time with Marlene, in with Andy, I learned a lot about forgiveness. Learned that you can mess up, but that doesn't, it doesn't mark you for life. Um, forgiveness is huge. And that um, good people mess up, they make mistakes but that doesn't mean that they're bad people. And so learning that from them really helped me a lot. And I learned that from my mom too. So um, all of these people helped me to learn these life lessons along the way. And so very appreciative of them. Um, I graduated that year, had one year with Marlene, and then I took a job at Ferris. Yes. Yep, Ferris. Sorry. That was interesting. Uh, I wanted a challenge. Took a picture of my name board. There we go. And I also became an RHA advisor. Which now I realize why my advisors really wanted to find other advisors. Because that work was hard. Man, RHA advisor took time. It took energy, people were needy. I was like, man, get away from me. But it was also very rewarding sometimes. But, you know, I understood exactly what they went through. You know, and you're registering people for conferences, you're making sure you have your roll call done, you know, you're meeting on a weekly basis with these students. And so it really does take a lot of work to advise certain student organizations. And I learned that, and that was a tough learning experience. Um, I also had my first staff team where I had all men, only two women <laughs> on my staff, which I thought was really weird, but it gave a certain group dynamic that um, the men on my staff really didn't care about anything. Like, it wasn't 
Um, they were pretty good with anything that you put their way. Whereas women, we had a lot of conversation about things and the man was like, I don't care. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, that's fine. I'm like, okay. So um, it was a very interesting staff team, very interesting personalities. And then I celebrated with my friends for a little bit. I had my Ferris shirt. Yeah, I was hesitant about that picture because, you know, that was proof that I worked at Ferris. But, you know, I was good for a minute. And then I went back to Grand Valley. <laughs> so I spent a year at Ferris, came back to Grand Valley, got quite a few pictures with that dude up there. I don't know. Andy is in a lot of my pictures. And that's my friend Oscar, who works at UMass Amherst right now. So still in touch with him. Funny story about Oscar. I went to the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity in New Orleans one year. And we were at like this late night like chicken place or whatever. And I'm like, man, that dude looks familiar. Then he walks up, he's like, tequila gear. I was like, oh, Oscar. So it was so weird. I hadn't seen him in years and saw him in New Orleans of all places. So that was really weird and fun. So it was really cool. And then at Grand Valley, we hosted a regional conference for um, housing officers. So that was a, a really intense learning experience and not saying that I ever want to do it again, but it was a great experience. And so there's Melanie and Dewan at the table and um, learned a lot about that, really good. I was here for three years. So one of the other things that helped me a lot, um, love Tupac. So growing up, I was always teased because I was dark skinned and it was, it was tough. I mean, people had jokes and I'd be like, oh, you want to go? So my grandfather is over here. I had to crop a picture. Uh, my granddaddy, Ely Wade Anderson Jr. And my uncle Greg right here, Greg Yarbrough. My uncle Greg was smooth. Uh, but they always made me feel great about being really dark. And they made me feel really beautiful. And so when Tupac came out and he said this verse, I was like, yes, thank you, somebody, you know? And so I'm like, Psh, whatever, <laughs> deeper the roots, all right. <laughs> so that was always my line, like, you know, because he made me feel great about who I was. And along with my granddaddy and my uncle, you know, I felt like somebody else knew, understood, got it. And so for my Uncle Greg, he, um, he used to get in a lot of trouble when he was younger. And I remember we would pack up a picnic basket, our whole family take trips, all my cousins and stuff. And we'd go visit him and, you know, we'd have a picnic outside and unpack our lunch. Then when I got older, I was like, Ma, where were we visiting Uncle Greg at? Girl, he was in jail. <laughs> what? So this lovely picnic and family time, we were visiting him in jail. But I never knew that as a kid. And he stayed in a lot of trouble because he also had a quick temper, but he also was a heroin addict. And so having someone who was close to me who was addicted to drugs, who later in life frequently overdosed and had to, you know, be revived, had 911 called. Eventually that hard life caught up with him and he died uh, a few months after my grandfather passed away. Well, a couple years, not a few months. A couple years after my grandfather passed away uh, because he had an enlarged heart because of his drug use. And so for me, that was tough because he wasn't very old when he passed away. And he always had a very commanding presence about him. And when I, I talk about my Uncle Greg, I think about all the stories I hear about him. Because my Uncle Greg, he was just ruthless back in the day. But my mother said he used to always date his teachers. So like, what? Yeah, that's how he graduated high school. He always dated his teachers. So, yeah, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, between him and my grandfather, I just, 
I thought the world of them. And my granddad, we always um, went over his house and cleaned his house for him on the weekends. And he actually was the one, he tolerated my singing. So he loved me. He told me I sang beautifully. So I really always liked that a lot. So I would just sing at his house for him. And he didn't, he never told me to shut up. So it was great. And he just always, always, um, I was his chocolate chip and, you know, we spent a lot of time together. So this is a really blurry picture because I got my master's degree. And I said, mom, can you please send me that picture? Well, that's the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little blurred. Present lovers, I was really excited because I never thought I'd get my bachelor's, let alone my master's degree. And so I was really excited and my family all came up to see me get my master's degree. And so that was a very good experience for me. But I never would have gotten my master's degree had, um, honestly, Andy said, you know, go take one class, see how you like it. I was like, man, I don't wanna go to school. I just left this place. And he was like, no, just go, you know, it's part of your contract, go take a class. I took a class and I liked it. And I was like, okay, I'm about to do the CSAL thing. And I threw myself into the program and I enjoyed it. I had a very great experience. Wonderful teachers who were almost pretty much all adjunct um, at the time. And then Lorraine came around and she was our first permanent faculty member. And she helped us out a lot and she was fantastic. So after I got my master's, Andy said, go put your resume out there and see what happens. Well, University of Toledo happened. Great learning experience. <laughs> Very good learning experience. Stay there for a year. Then I went to the University of Michigan. Very interesting place to work. Um, I stayed there for four years in housing. The first time I ever got to truly focus on my students and my RAs because I had an office coordinator and I had an office assistant. I said, I don't even know what to do with y'all. So they pretty much did their own thing. They took care of the administrative work and I focused on staff development. But I also was trying to figure out the students there. It is a fantastic place. The students are smart, but they are some interesting people. Um, I really didn't know what to do at U of M. And again, I saw Andy and he said, are you ready to come back and supervise, you know, full-time staff? I was like, yeah, I'm ready. And so, well, before that, I got married. I forgot to tell you that. <laughs> I forgot about that. So I got married. I didn't put a picture of my ex-husband up there. Um, but Dewan was in my wedding and there's my sister and then my half-sister, Deborah. So um, I put that picture up there because I thought I looked cute on my wedding day. So, and I had a tiara, hi. So I'm all about the tiaras. Then I became an aunt. It's my nephew, Nathan. Yeah, small as he ever was. So, and then I had a baby, Sir Jamario. Baby, he had afro. Check, this afro was tight, though. Um, he gave me heartburn, and so I still have it to this day. And then I came back to Grand Valley. There we go. And so my people is at Grand Valley. In housing, we love pictures. So we took lots of pictures. We had a holiday party, and the assistant director group thought it would be funny to make funny faces. And Beth tried to run out of the picture because she was like, I'm not doing this. But we still got part of her. So she's at the end trying to run away. And so this is the housing group, and then Brenda, my mentor, my friend, Brenda's the one who told me I need to stand up for myself. So if I ever said something to you, that was a little forceful, it's her fault. But <laughs> no, I appreciate Brenda so much. <laughs> Brenda helped me out so much as a, um, as a living center director before and then as an assistant director. So enjoy all the relationships that I made. And then part of the club that no one wants to belong to. 
So even though my dad had his demons and was not the father that I always wanted him to be, he was still my dad. And when he passed away, it was devastating. Um, in the pictures I have with him, with his hat and glasses, he wore hat and glasses everywhere. This dude, I don't know what he thought, but he wore hat and glasses all the time. It could be midnight and he was wearing sunglasses. So um, when he passed away, that was really tough. He passed away on his birthday and um, he was in the hospital because of high blood pressure and um, they were taking him into surgery and he died on the table. So it was really tough. And at that time, that was the first time I met my brother, my half brother, my older half brother. I met him in the hospital. And that was kind of weird, but it actually felt very natural. And that is the only picture that I have with all my siblings and then my ex-husband and my sister's husband. So all of us are together. It was an interesting experience, but my older sister and I are so much alike. Deborah and I, we like some of the same thing, most of the same things. Um, our personalities are very similar and um, she's just a great person to talk to. And then, you notice I said my ex-husband. So you don't sign up to be a single parent. So for me, you know, to the world, you may be one person, but to one person, you may be the world. It's like a whole different meaning um, once I got divorced. And so for, for me, my son, my nephew, and my nieces are my world. You know, the twins, Adriana and Ariana, um, who are there with their mom in the middle. And then Nathan. Nathan and Jamario are like brothers. They're so close in age. They're a little over a year and a half apart. Um, and Nathan treats Jamario as his baby, even though Jamario's like bigger than him. Nathan's just taller. But my son likes to take weird and crazy pictures. So funny faces. If you're friends with me on Facebook, you'll see his pictures. But um, those are the reasons why Black Lives Matter to me because of my boys, my nieces, and you know, having to have conversations with him about how he should act around police officers if he stopped, and to let them know that he has special needs. He was diagnosed as autistic when he was um, two years old, and then they changed it to cognitive impaired, but we still keep him under that autism label because there's no other way, like, you can't walk and say he's cognitive impaired. What does that mean? You know, a lot of people don't understand that. And so for me, my life is all about building relationships. So these are some of the people that I've built those relationships with. It doesn't include everyone because I don't have pictures of everybody, but a lot of people in this room, y'all have touched me so much. I'm really excited that you're here. But some of the ways that, um, I've forged relationships with people and had um, really great experiences. A lot came from being in housing and that role, but also just being in different places around campus and being able to spend time and to talk, have those conversations. I really believe that conversation is important and that you take time for the people that you care about. So, thanking people for being a friend. These are people that I've known for years and that care deeply. Ryan over here in the middle between Brenda and myself, he was uh, my first grad that actually stayed at Grand Valley. <laughs> we can talk about that another time. But uh, Ryan, I still connect with him. He now lives in Alaska with his husband and their beautiful baby girl. And so, um, love him to death. And of course, Dewan and Nikki and Marcus. So my people who have been there for me through a lot and Lauren. And then Becky and Kelly and Jay. And Shantae and Jason are the worst offenders of encouraging my child to make funny faces. So that picture right there, they were like, let's take a picture. 
Yeah, thank you, Shantae and Jason. I appreciate that very much. So, um, but thankful for everyone that I've made connections with. Teresa, who doesn't always take pictures with me, but I love that you did take one, and Eric. So, and then over here, oh yeah, there's Teresa right there. And then there's a picture of my mom with my auntie and my son and my, my younger brother. And my son is taller than all of us. So every time he comes around, he's five, eight and a half. So the rest of us are a little bit shorter than that. But he thinks it's hilarious. And he's like, Mom, I'm taller than you. That don't mean I still can't knock you down. But you know, it's all good. We have a good time. And then my big thing is students. I love being here because of the students that I get to work with. They are amazing, wonderful, thoughtful, fantastic. Um, they bring joy to my world. I enjoy coming to work every day because of the students and the people that I get to work with. And, you know, I think about Grand Valley, and for me, Grand Valley is home. It's where I grew up. And for the good and the bad, I love being here. So, I'm living my life like it's golden because every day that I wake up, I'm happy and I'm grateful. And I try to be positive in those experiences. So, I like being positive. If you see me sad or upset one day, it has to be something really big because I try my best to be happy on a daily basis. Because you know, that's just me. And um, this last one. Oh! <laughs> Wear my shirt on purpose. So, but thank you. So that's a little bit about me. And thank you so much for listening and for coming out. I really appreciate it very much.